Previously, we discussed how skeletal muscle cells of our body can actually regulate the process of glycolysis. And in that discussion, what we said was there are three major types of regulatory points in glycolysis, and these three regulatory points are actually some of the enzymes that regulate that process. So we have phosphofructokinase, hexokinase, and pyruvate kinase. So this is the enzyme that catalyzes step three, this is the enzyme that catalyzes step one, and this is the enzyme that catalyzes step 10. And the reason our cells use these three enzymes is because these catalyze irreversible steps in glycolysis. Now, phosphofructokinase, as we said, is the most important regulatory enzyme, and that's because it catalyzes the irreversible commitment step. So once this step actually takes place, this fructose 1,6-bisphosphate that is transformed from fructose 6-phosphate by phosphofructokinase has to go on and complete the process of glycolysis. Now, now we're going to talk about liver cells. And before we actually begin, let's compare the functionality of muscle cells and liver cells. So skeleton muscle cells essentially have one function and that function is to allow us to actually move voluntarily. So if I want to move my hand back and forth, my skeleton muscle produces the ATP via glycolysis to allow that voluntary movement. Now, what about liver cells? Well, liver cells have a much more complex biochemical role. And what that means is they not only use the glycolysis to produce ATP molecules that the liver cells actually need to survive, but the liver also has to do things like maintain the glucose levels in our blood. If the levels are too high, uptake that glucose and transform it into glycogen. If the levels are too low, break down that glycogen and release the glucose into our bloodstream so that the other cells of our body can essentially use that glucose to form ATP molecules. And it has many, many other roles. For instance, it uses the glycolysis process to basically synthesize building blocks like fatty acids, as well as amino acids and so forth. So liver cells have many different types of functions. And as a result, it's no surprise that the way that our liver cells regulate the process of glycolysis is more complex than the way that our skeleton muscle cells regulate the process of glycolysis. So in our discussion, we're going to focus on liver cells and how liver cells regulate the process of glycolysis. And although we'll see many similarities between skeleton muscle cells and liver cells, we'll see that liver cells use a slightly more complex um, regulatory pathway. Let's begin with phosphofructokinase. So once again, phosphofructokinase is the most important regulatory enzyme. And what it does is it regulates that commitment step. It transforms the fructose 6-phosphate into the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, which is committed to that step. And this is our enzyme that catalyzes that step. Now, let's remember how skeleton muscle cells actually regulate this enzyme. So they use ATP and AMP molecules. So let's suppose we have a high energy charge in the cell. And what that means is we have a high ratio of ATP to AMP. Remember, energy charge simply means the ratio of ATP to AMP. Now, if we're resting, this is basically what we're going to have. We're going to have too many ATP molecules. And so what that means is we don't want to produce any more ATP molecules. We have plenty of ATP molecules to go around. And so phosphofructokinase will be inhibited by that large concentration of ATP. And ATP acts as an allosteric inhibitor. On the other hand, if we don't have many ATP molecules in the cell, then we have a low energy charge value, so low ratio, <clears throat> and we have many more AMP molecules, and they will bind onto the phosphofructokinase and essentially activate them. They will, uh, they will make them much more likely to actually convert the fructose 6-phosphate into the fructose 1,6-biphosphate, bisphosphate. So basically the takeaway lesson here is the same two allosteric molecules that are used by skeleton muscle cells to control phosphofructokinase is also used by liver cells, but there are many important differences. 
Difference number one, in skeleton muscle cells, the pH actually affects the activity of phosphofructokinase. So in our discussion previously, we said that a low pH or a very acidic environment basically inactivates, inhibits phosphofructokinase in skeleton muscle cells. And that's because in skeleton muscle cells, as we exercise, there can be a buildup in lactic acid. But in liver cells, there is usually no buildup in lactic acid. And that's partly because the liver cells actually are responsible for breaking down that lactic acid into glucose molecules. And that's exactly why the phosphofructokinase is not affected by the pH in liver cells. Now, the second important difference is the molecule citrate. So citrate, as we'll see in just a moment, just like ATP molecules, is another example of an allosteric inhibitor to phosphofructokinase. So let's suppose in our, in our liver cells, we have a high oxygen content, but we don't have many ATP molecules. Well, if we don't have many ATP molecules, then the glycolysis process will continue and will form many ATP molecules and also pyruvate molecules. And because we're under aerobic conditions, the pyruvate will essentially enter the mitochondria and carry out the citric acid cycle. Now, one of the initial intermediates of the citric acid cycle is a molecule known as citrate. And citrate is ultimately formed from the pyruvate molecule that enters that mitochondria. Now, eventually, after we form many ATP molecules and the concentration of ATP rises and the energy charge of the cell increases, we will not want to form any more ATP molecules because what that will mean is not only will we have enough ATP molecules to go around, we'll also have enough citrate molecules to actually create ATP molecules. And so in this particular case, if we have plenty of ATP molecules, that means we'll have plenty of pyruvate molecules and plenty of citrate molecules circling in that Krebs cycle. And so if we have a high citrate, uh, um, citrate concentration in the cytoplasm, that citrate will go on and bind onto phosphofructokinase and it will basically increase the ability of the ATP to actually inhibit the phosphofructokinase. And so just like ATP, citrate is also an allosteric inhibitor to the phosphofructokinase. And this is the second important difference between the phosphofructokinase in skeletal muscle cells and the one in liver cells. <coughs> so we can summarize that in the following diagram. So, Let's say the glucose enters the cell, it's transformed into glucose 6-phosphate, then it becomes fructose 6-phosphate, and then the phosphofructase transforms it into the fructose 1-bisphosphate, and now we have many steps that take place, and ultimately we form that pyruvate molecule. And in the presence of oxygen, the pyruvate will enter the mitochondria, and it will eventually form citrate intermediate molecules. And so we, and we also form ATP molecules after glycolysis. And so <coughs> if we essentially have many of these ATP molecules and citrate molecules, they will create a negative feedback loop that will go back and bind onto the phosphofructokinase and that will essentially diminish the activity of that phosphofructokinase. So if we have many ATP, this will stop the process of glycolysis so that we don't overproduce the ATP molecules. Now, one of the functions of liver cells that I mentioned earlier is the fact that they're responsible for actually maintaining a concentration, a normal concentration of glucose. Because if we have too many glucose in the blood, that can be toxic to our body. So let's suppose we just ingest a meal that is rich in carbohydrates. And so the concentration of ATP in our blood essentially increases. And it's the job of the liver cells to basically uptake all that glucose to bring the blood level glucose back to normal. Now, what does the cell actually do with the glucose? Well, it can form ATP molecules, it can form many different types of building blocks, it can form glycogen. And what that means is in these situations, 
the phosphofructokinase must be activated by some type of uh, some type of powerful activator molecule to actually uptake all those glucose molecules and convert those glucose molecules into these different types of things and so something that we don't find in skeleton muscle cells that we have in liver cells is this feedback known as feed forward stimulation so Let's take a look at the following diagram. So let's suppose we ingest all these carbohydrates. So in our blood, we have a high level of glucose. And what that means is these liver cells will, will begin to absorb those glucose and the glucose molecules will be transformed ultimately into fructose 6-phosphate. Now, high levels of glucose means we'll have high levels of fructose 6-phosphate. And when, when we have very high levels of fructose 6-phosphate in a cytoplasm, some of them will begin transforming into a molecule known as fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Now, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is a very potent, very powerful activator of phosphofructokinase. And what it allows the cells to do is, it allows them to convert all these glucose molecules, uptake the glucose molecules from the blood, bring that glucose level back to normal, and essentially convert those glucose molecules into either ATP molecules or other types of molecules. So, we ultimately see there are two types of, inhi of inhibitors and two types of activators. So we have ATP molecules and citrate molecules that inhibit the phosphofructokinase. But the AMP molecules and the fructose 2,6-bisphosphate are actually activators of the fructose uh, of the phosphofructokinase enzyme. So once again, when fructose 6-phosphate concentration is high, some of it is transformed into fructose 2,6-bisphosphate and this molecule is an allosteric activator of the enzyme. It binds to that enzyme, stimulates its activity, and it continually carries out this process quickly and effectively. Now let's move on to hexokinase. So, Let's suppose inside our blood, we have a high concentration of ATP. Um, inside our cells, we have a high concentration of ATP, so we're essentially at rest. And the high amount of ATP will begin to inhibit the phosphofructokinase. Now, once phosphofructokinase is inhibited, so this molecule is basically inhibited, PFK is phosphofructokinase, then we're going to see that there is a buildup of this substrate molecule that is a substrate to this enzyme, fructose 6-phosphate. So by the way, this is step one of glycolysis, step two of glycolysis, and step three of glycolysis. And once there is a buildup of this molecule because of the inhibition of this molecule by the ATP, this molecule is in equilibrium with this molecule. And so if we increase the concentration of this, if there's a buildup of this by Lichtenclair's principle, it will shift this way and increase the concentration of glucose 6-phosphate. Now, glucose 6-phosphate is the product molecule to this reaction. So glucose is transformed by hexakinase in the first step of glycolysis to form glucose 6-phosphate. And as we increase the concentration of glucose 6-phosphate due to the inhibition of PFK, that increase in concentration will inhibit the hexokinase. And this same exact uh, re uh, regulatory mode is actually used by skeleton muscles as well. So just as in skeleton muscle cells, glucose 6-phosphate is also an allosteric inhibitor to hexokinase. And this is the process that allows the phosphofructokinase to actually communicate with the hexokinase and essentially tell it to turn off that first step in glycolysis. And, one th and once these two uh, irreversible steps are essentially turned off, that greatly diminishes the rate at which the glycolytic pathway actually takes place. Now, there is one important difference between hexokinases in liver cells and hexokinases in skeleton muscle cells. In liver cells, we have this same hexokinase that we also have in muscle cells, but in liver cells, we have an, a, um, an important isozyme to this particular hexokinase. Now, let's recall what an isozyme is.
So two protein molecules that are different are said to be isozymes if they essentially catalyze that, that same similar type of process. And the isozyme to the hexokinase that is found in liver cells but is not found in skeletal muscle cells is glucokinase. So unlike in skeletal muscle tissue, there is an isozyme to hexokinase present in liver cells known as glucokinase. Now, what is the major difference between glucokinase and hexokinase? Well, there are two important differences. Number one, glucokinase has a much lower affinity for that glucose substrate molecule than hexokinase. In fact, hexokinase is 50 times more likely to bind to the glucose substrate than that glucokinase. And that will create a very important difference as we'll see in just a moment. The second important difference between hexokinase and, and glucokinase is that hexokinase is inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate when the concentration is high, but glucokinase is not affected, is not inhibited by that glucose 6-phosphate. So we see that unlike hexokinase, which is inhibited by high amounts of glucose 